Uh, and a lot of prayer and a lot of discussion and a lot of stuff, so it gets a bit personal now. That's why I wanted you to pray for me so you don't fall out with me. But it gets a bit personal. Uh, and I wanted to do that because um, we've got a talk tomorrow, then we've got communion, and then we're all off over the place, and I'm on, I'll see you again. Um, hopefully I will. So it's it's about sort of, you know, we're singing those words and everything, uh, which Josh put up there, which are great, and, you know, we choose to follow him and everything. and. Uh, I just, I just wonder if, if, and I'm talking to myself, um, I wonder if we do follow him. And I ask you if you'd wanted to have a look at Mark 14, uh, the passage. Um, it's about, well, it's about lots of stuff. Uh, it, it's an amazing passage, Mark 14. It sets out lots of things. You know, Jesus is anointed uh, the Last Supper. Jesus predicts Peter's denial, um, the garden, the arrest. Uh, uh, and it goes on and on, and then it goes into Peter's denial and that stuff. And I wanted to talk a little bit about about that, about Peter, who's uh, absolutely my favourite character in the Bible. I I, I, I love him to bits because I just you know him and David, King David. I can relate to them. Uh, I, I really can, through especially this last eighteen months and stuff uh, that I've been through. Um, and one of the things that I did go for a run while you guys were in the pub, no guilt there or anything, it's fine. <laughs> once, one, once a, you can take the PTI out of the core, but you can't take the core out of the PTI. Um, so, so I had a run, and when I was running, I had this, um, I like running, and I'm being honest and, and open with you, because uh, it helps with, not, not depression or whatever I, I struggle with at times, it, it's when I feel close to God in, in running, and I pray I, I get a few more few more years of that, please, Lord. Uh, and it's when I feel closest to him when I'm on my own. Um, I, I, I love it. Um, I've never been a team player, really, sports. I love individual stuff because um, I, I just appreciate that I, that I can run. And when I was running here, um, uh, Rhett gave me a, a, a route to go out to the, near the back gate, find that little hole through there, and then follow the fence all the way around, which I did. I did it like, three times, I think, or something like that. And, uh, and I was thinking when I was running around, uh, I felt quite honored to be inside the fence. I know you know what I mean, um, as a vet. I thought, you know, I love it. I, I feel inside the fence. It's, I'm not the other side of the fence. I'm this side. I've been cleared. It's all that stuff. You know, I, I feel part of it, the military. It's a big part of my life, which I've shared with you. And I was running around just having these thoughts. Then I, then I was thinking about us. I wonder how many people in here, metaphorically, feel that the they're not inside the fence with their faith. They're outside the fence. Doesn't mean that they don't know Jesus. Doesn't mean that they're not a Christian. Doesn't mean that they don't all that stuff, go to church, read the Bible, DDD, and pray and everything, which is fantastic. But do you feel like you're inside the fence? And I thought, you know, well, God hopefully spoke to me, and it's not just me. I thought there's some of us in here that uh, know all that stuff, but we're the other side of the fence. Uh, and it made me quite sad when I was running around, and I was praying for you that we feel that we get inside the fence. So you have this relationship with God. And I've told you, mine's quite comical at times and, and quite heavy at times. Uh, but I'm inside the fence. If that, it's not look at me, da, 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 da. I'm just saying I feel like I've gone through, again, the last 18 months, two years. I feel like I've come inside the fence. I've known him since 93. But in the last couple of years, I feel like I've stepped in the fence. And then I was thinking, well, that's great, Lord. You know, it's fantastic to say that. And I will say it. I'll honor you. But how do you, how do you get in the fence? And I felt him say to me, you have to go through the gate. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks. Is that what I say to him? You have to go through the gate. And I know the metaphor all falls apart with security and all the MOD and everything. But we have to go through the gate. We have to walk through somehow. And you need to work that out. And I've had a few conversations with some of you that I think that's why God gave me that picture. The, 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 you're running close to the fence, you're just not the other side of the fence. And, and I pray tonight that you go through the gate, whatever that means, if that's you. And you sit inside the fence, because that's where you belong. That's where you're supposed to be, not the other side looking in, the inside looking out. Be in the world, but not of it. So that's just one of my prayers and one of the pictures that I got when I was um, running, which we all should. <laughs> Um, so let me, let me pray. Father, I just pray that you help us now 
uh, gather together as we talk, like the disciples did, and they gathered and they talked and they chatted and they laughed and they cried and they were made vulnerable and they were scared and they had to face stuff and, and all that stuff and it's not changed. We do that now, gathered here. And I just pray, Lord, that you just help us um, tonight. If it's going through the gate, let's get in the gate. Let's get inside the fence and let's, let's start whatever that is you want us to do. Uh, and, and I pray that you would help us as a group. Help us, Lord. Your Holy Spirit, come. Just draft through us. Help us. Let us be open. Anything that's stopping you getting in, I pray in the name of Jesus, it be gone now. And we just become open, honest, vulnerable. And uh, just for tonight, let's do some business with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think one of the biggest lies that we've been fed as a, as a modern day, this generation maybe, is to, um, is to be independent. <clears throat> It's to be self-sufficient, you know, that you, you don't need anybody. You'll be fine. You've got this. Just crack on on your own. And, and the military enforces that, I think, a little bit. Uh, and and I've shared some of my past with you. And, you know, I, I had that. I didn't get much help. And I thought I can crack on and I'll do this stuff on my own. The trouble with that philosophy is it's not how we're designed. It, it's not work. It's, it's contrary to the way we're designed as human beings. We're designed chemically for connection we're designed to be sort of codependent with one another we're designed to love each other and help each other and we're designed to be in tribes really when you look, look back through history not giving you a history lesson and never in the history of people have we not lived in tribes until now we're now so separated uh, and so isolated and in big communities but we're lonely all the time. I think it was Mother Teresa that said, you know, um, poverty is not the biggest issue in this world. It's loneliness that is the killer. And, and I was reading an article about a few months ago um, about funerals, as you do, and, and crematoriums, as you do as a vicar. And, uh, and I was amazed that there was this article where some of the councils are supplying people, I don't know if you ever read it, that they're supplying people to stand at funerals just so that the funeral people are not on their own, so the coffin's not buried on its own. So the council will give you someone who stands there. Uh, and I thought, how sad is that? That nobody can be there and that the council supplies someone to stand there. And it was this woman who's employed to go to funerals and crematoriums and everything and just stand there uh, and be someone when somebody dies. And it made me think of that quote with Mother Teresa. It's not poverty, it's not lack of bread. It's fellowship, and, and it's this way we've been taught to be so independent. <clears throat> I think research says that it takes five or six people to raise a child. There's that African proverb that we all know that, no, it takes a village to raise a child. And if you've done that, you understand it, because it's, that, it's how much emotional connection is required if we want it done properly. We have to be emotionally connected. That's where we're designed chemically. And we're taught this lie about being independent and being self-sufficient. And it's, it's a wrong philosophy. It really is. And so contrary to the Bible, if we knock and say we're a Christian. We constantly hear about this sort of self-improvement, don't we? Self-esteem, self-help, self-this, self-that. You know, nothing to do with group affiliation. If you've ever been into a bookshop uh, and you look at the self-help racks, there's hundreds of them. Try and find the racks that say helping others. Find, find those books that say helping others, the helping other racks. It, it's not there. It's all about self-improvement, which there's nothing wrong with that. But, but we need to be careful. So this group affiliation, which I was saying to Rhett, you know, I, I miss the military. I really do. And it's been a while now. I've been out since 93, but I still miss it. I mean, I miss this, whatever this is, whatever we're doing, you know. Um, the importance of the tribe group affiliation, <clears throat> or, or the team, um, or, or just being friends. You know, the, the importance of that is when you don't feel great, when you're, when you're struggling a little bit, you know, when you've lost that sort of life spark, whatever it is that gets you going and your glass becomes very half empty, when you're down, maybe depressed a little bit, as Churchill used to say, he had black dog days, 
You know, I, I get those. And, and you've got to learn to, to get out of them. But that's when the group, the affiliation, the tribe stuff can start to kick in. If you get my drift, it's, it's like, it's okay, I don't feel great. I'm not 100%. For me, I'll go for a run. But I'm not 100%. You know, but my group is okay. My team, my, my, my tribe, my whatever it might be. You know, my, my family is doing okay, so that's good. You know, um, and my job's okay, that's all right. And the people I work with, my colleagues, you know, my tribe's okay, so actually I'm okay. You can reflect on that, and, and psychologically it helps, a proven fact. But when you're on your own, Proverbs 13, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But now we don't have that resilience because we are totally encouraged to be solo. And I think it's a massive lie that we're getting caught into. You know, we are the most connected people that have ever been on a planet. All the stuff that we can do and everything. But we are also the most isolated and lonely people that we've ever been in history. I don't get that. Mobile phones. You know, you constantly go to... Um, so I had this thing with my daughter now, Phoebe is 25, like I said, she's a, a photographer, fashion photographer. And, uh, and I've done it with, and I try and do it, and I, and I do it with Amanda. You know, you go to a restaurant, you put your phone on the, on the table, don't you? I hate it, it really drives me mad, drives me mad. And I've said to my daughter, Phoebe, I don't want your phone on the table. And we had this sort of discussion, she's quite, she's quite hard sort of headed, don't know where she gets that from, but she is. And I said, look, I don't want the phone on the table when we're out. Because it's like having another person there. And if that rings, that person's more important than the company you're with. And that's wrong. It's not right. So, you know, you see people, you see couples in restaurants. And they're both sat there, probably paying a fortune for the meal. And they're both on the bloody phone all the time doing stuff. Where's the conversation? And I'm terrible at it as well. But I've started putting my phone down there. I will not have it on the table because it's not part of my company. I'm not paying for the phone to go out and eat. <laughs> In a way. Um, so we, we are taught and trained to be independent from an early age. And I'm trying to crack that with my, with my daughter, the opposite. Uh, and we're chemically designed to be codependent. So there's this battle, there's this tension uh, going on all the time. And we need each other to survive. We, we just do. You know, but you have to learn or relearn those skills. You know, be educated or again, re-educated if, if you're my age. Uh, and most of all, we have to learn to trust people. And I think that's really hard. Again, in the military, I think it's really hard to be vulnerable and to trust people and to do stuff. And I guess that's going on in this room as well. You know, I'm not going there with that. I hope he's not going to do that. I ain't going to go there. And I'm not doing that. That's what we say straight away. And what I'd hope we'd say is like, I don't care what I'm saying. Like, Come on, let's go for it. Because I'm gone in the morning. Let's just try and get this precious moment to, together. Um, but we have to trust people, trust that they've got your back, that they believe in you, that they won't desert you. And when it gets difficult, they'll be around. And I think that's what was really, in my opinion, anyway, what was really devastating about COVID. It, it really was. And, and it's caused a lot of damage. And that's another conversation to have, but, but not tonight. That's a debate. Uh, you know, a lot of people are seriously damaged through what happened, and I'm not proportioning blame uh, to things, but uh, I could. But we become very self-protected during that time, and I think we became very fearful during that time, and we became very sort of individual uh, at that time as well, and that, that's had consequences. And, you know, crime went up. I work in the prison system, the justice sector. During COVID, crime went up, I don't know how much percent, but it, it increased. Depression, mental health illness, prescriptions, doctors, everything went up during that time. And that's got to be a consequence for something, hasn't it? I think people became really fearful. I don't know about the military, but I think outside people became really fearful and didn't want to go near anywhere and got panicky and got angry and all that stuff. And I don't, I don't think that the church coped really well with it either, personally. That's another conversation that we can have. But when you look at it, you know, COVID-19 um, was not the first pandemic that the church had ever been through. If you look at your history, I know you know that better than me. The church is very familiar with the uh, pandemics and plagues throughout history. Uh, and, and the way the church reacted during 
this time, I think, is, um, and I was quite vocal in my own church about it. I was running a site, and, you know, we got told by the hierarchy to close all the sites. And I thought, look at that, I'm not closing the site. I didn't, because we had a food bank going. I was running a, a church up in, in North London, one of the sites from HTB. And, you know, and this edict came through that we have to close the doors. I said, no, I'm not doing it. So, so I got a bit of a sort of telling off for that, but I didn't do it. I kept the doors open because we had a food bank and we were feeding people who were starving. And I thought, I'm not shutting the doors. So we opened the doors and put a six foot table and we fed loads of people from there. You know, I was trying to be, trying to be disciplined and not let everyone in the church, but I didn't agree with that closing the church person. It's not what the churches do. You know, we don't close the doors. You know, for example, after the plague that swept through the Roman Empire in the third century, uh, the Bishop of um, Alexandria uh, reflected um, the Christian response during that plague. And in his Easter letter, he wrote this, which was amazing. He wrote, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves in thinking only of one another. Needless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them, they departed this life sincerely happy. Oh, don't you love that? Come on. I mean, we didn't do that, did we? I mean, no, Chris, but we didn't do that. We shut the doors and we self-protected. We put them out and said, you know, don't come near me. And, and, and I thought that was um, not sure we did the best we could possibly we do. But that desire to save our own skin is... Um, it's a deep and abiding desire in all of us. It's the one reason why people make these runs on stores that I was talking about you know, uh, yesterday uh, and buy all the supplies without any thought of what other people may need. You know, like I said, the toilet rolls was a funny one, but you know, the queues at petrol stations, all you need is one issue on the BBC and bang, you can't get a petrol station. Everyone's panicking, filling the tanks, getting the jerry cans, doing this. and It's panic and it's fear, isn't it? But the people that are doing that don't really care about anyone else who can't get petrol. It's a selfish, individual attitude that we have. And again, I'm not blaming people. I'm just exercising some thought. And of course, it's wise and, and it's okay to buy extra food and supplies in, in a time like that. But the point is, did you, did we, when we were doing that or thinking about doing that, did we think about anyone else? Or did we just think of ourselves? And that's why I'm not special, but I wouldn't shut the doors on that church. I'm not going to do it. It's not just about me and self-protection. It's like that, um, do you remember the film with Michael Caine, The Italian Job, when, when they sang that song, The Self-Preservation Society, when they nicked all the gold and everything? It's a bit like that. We've gone self-preservation. We just want to look after ourselves. And that's not what we do as Christians, talking to myself. That's not what we do. And to, to give you a little sort of insight into the, why I'm talking, and I am talking about myself, you know, I was um, 67 years without a tattoo. And I think that's pretty good going. 17 years in the army, a spell in prison, a dysfunctional family, you know, father from Toxtis, mother from Birkenhead, and I lived in Manchester, no tattoos, brilliant. And then when I went through that issue, uh, I told you about with uh, where my faith was tested a little bit, I am... Um, I had this desire to get a tattoo. I'm not saying God told me to get a tattoo. Let's not go into that stuff. Um, but I had that on my arm. Uh, and it's, uh, it's from the Psalms. It says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And the reason I put it there is when I'm cleaning my teeth, I can see it. Because I need to be reminded that he's my shepherd and I will not want. That's just my quirk. That's why I had that. And then my daughter said to me, um, Daddy, should we get a, a, a tattoo together? I said, all right. She said, uh, I found this tattoo parlor in Hackney in London and it's really cool and it's brilliant and I'm going to have a tattoo and do you want one? And I've got this idea, you should have a cross because you're a priest. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, so I had this cross, which is, don't ever get a tattoo on there, it's really painful. Um, so I had this cross put on there and the reason I had the cross put on there is to remind me that I'm a Christian. Sounds weird, but it is. It's to remind me that I'm inside the fence. That's what that's for. And then while that took um, about two hours of complete pain and me trying to show this woman that I wasn't scared and it wasn't hurting, but it was killing me, um, Phoebe had a tattoo after that and she had a little smiley face on her ankle, which took about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you don't have to go out and have tattoos. I'm not saying that. But for me, it's, um, I, I needed something to remind me um, because I'm a bit quirky of where I am and what I'm doing and, and who I'm with. And, uh, you know, at the foot of the cross, I have to hold on to that every single day in my life. And that reminds me that I'm not on my own. I don't have to panic. And that's just, that's just the stuff for me. So what that bishop said is, is, is amazing. We just need to think uh, of other people. And it's not about self-preservation, as the bishop said. It, it, it can't be uh, about that. We, we can't do that as Christians. Um, and in the Gospel of Mark, which I wanted you to have a read through, it's an extraordinary um, book. Uh, Mark ends the account of Jesus' arrest by telling us that all the disciples ran away. That's why I wanted to get a bit personal about this stuff, uh, that they ran away. And, uh, you know, one guy is so scared that he runs away naked. Uh, which was, I always think that's really funny. And some say that that was Mark that ran away naked. And he wrote, the, yeah, what's going on there? Um, so it must have been really scary. And Mark's point that he's bringing all this stuff out, in my opinion, I'm no theologian, is that um, the ruling emotion in all those guys that were gathered there was the desire to, to save their own skin. And there's nothing wrong with that, to a point. Um, the, the mood was, I suppose, you know, it's every man for themselves. They must have just gone, you know, scattered everywhere when that mob turned up. And everyone close to Jesus, he goes on to say, Mark, that, you know, everyone was so terrified that they, that they were running away. And all the people gathered around Jesus at that time, you know, we'll be here, we'll stay here, we'll do this, we'll do that. They all disappeared. And, and I'm not going to say like cowards, but they all disappeared self-preservation they were scared and they ran away and they left him in that garden on his own and, and i say to us rhetorically would we would you would i run away from jesus when things got crazy you know when, when fear kicks in you know i have done i told you i walked around the village shouting at him angry at him cursing him at, at some point you know will we choose to to abandon Jesus over the honor of staying with him. When, when evil kicks in and stuff comes around us and, and this stuff you know, happens and tragic events happen. Some of you have shared some stuff with me, you know. And, and amazingly, you've stayed there. Maybe a bit wobbly, but you've stayed there when that stuff kicks in and that's when the rubber hits the road. That's about your faith. We can all sing the songs and go to church and do the stuff. When it gets pear-shaped, do we stay? And even more, do we help others when we're panicking and scared but not showing it? Do we help others who are in the same place? Something to ponder. Or will we bear witness um, to the value of our, our own skin or our own lives? You know, what kind of witness will we be or what kind of witness are we? Something only you know that stuff. So Mark and Peter's denial, which I think is an extraordinary um, story, and, and, and I go back to it all the time. Sometimes we, we tell this story in, in such a way, it gives Peter such a sort of, um, you know, such a, a bad rap. Um, and depending on which commentary you look at, and actually when you look at most of the commentaries about this, in, in my limited experience, they, they, they all put Peter in this sort of cowardly, sort of weak, failed miserable what is he he was this and then he was that and you know he doesn't come out in in um in a good light in the stuff that i've read you know it comes out that he's weak he's a coward a bit of a failure that you know when when it got really tight he let jesus down really big time but i would say did he did he let him down the thing we often fail to recognize is that up to the very last moment of peter's career this night, I think, had been a night of reckless courage. And that's what I wanted to, to look at with you. Bear with me. If you remember, he had begun by, you know, drawing his sword in the garden. Peter. You know, a mob comes, they're all, you know, they've got clubs and stuff and all sorts from the high priest coming to get Jesus. It was always set up. You know, Judas, all that stuff. We know the story. And then um, Peter draws his sword with the crazy courage of a man that uh, is going to take the whole mob on. He'll just wipe them out. You know, it's not, no one's getting near my boss. I'll take them all on. And uh, by himself, 
And in that scuffle, you know, he, he wounded the servant of the high priest. You know what he did? He cut his ear off. So he was in big trouble. One for carrying a sword was a death penalty, a weapon. You weren't allowed to do that by Roman uh, law. And, and the other one is that he took the ear off and seriously damaged the, the geezer that works for the high priest. Another death sentence. Not doing well, uh, our Peter. Um, and you would have thought after that, you know, doing that stuff, even though Jesus healed that, they healed the ear. Um, you would have thought after that, common sense would start to kick in and would have told Peter maybe to lie low for a little while. Just let, just let the heat get off the streets. You know what I mean? Just, just chill. Just disappear uh, a little bit. Let the heat die down before you start showing your face on the streets again. Not Peter. Oh, no, not really. In this situation, the last place you would have thought Peter would have gone to, is the courtyard of the high priest, who he just cut the bloke's ear off. But he goes to the very place where he could get arrested and everyone's there. Now, is that foolishness or is that bravery? You decide. Is it madness? The sheer audacity of what, of what he did always makes me think, what a bloke he was. You know, facing this d d death, really, in, in horrid ways. And it may be that the others had fled as well. You know, like I said, one was so scared he ran away naked. What happened to him? I've no idea. You know, but Peter was going to keep his word. He said he'd always be with Jesus. He wouldn't depart from him. Even when the others had disappeared, he, he was brought to the place where Jesus was. He was going to stick with Jesus like he said he would. Then in my mind, when he does that, in, in my heart, I, I think human nature kicks in with Peter and fear starts to abound and anxiety and self-preservation. And oh my goodness, what the heck am I doing here? A panic sets in and faith starts to go down, half empty glass, uh, and he's in, a real, he's in a real state. So when he comes back into this environment, he makes sure he keeps himself at a safe distance you know, between him and Jesus. Um, he's still hoping to save his own skin, but he's drawn to the master. So he's in this predicament uh, all the time. It does want to, he doesn't want to be tried and executed. He knows what happened. There's a mock trial going on. It's a whole setup. He's not stupid. He knows where it's probably going to go. And this is the same Peter who said he would follow Jesus to death. Verse 31, it's written for everyone to see, for time and immemorial. And he's sitting by the fire, you know, for the night was cold. And if you've been out there, I went out to Jerusalem, I did all this, this stuff with, um, with Graham Tomlin, a uh, mate of mine, he's the bishop, Bishop Graham Tomlin. I went out and we did some stuff and we walked around all the places. And it gets really chilly at night if you've been out there, it is cold. So there would have been a fire. Um, and, and, and I know that. And, and no doubt he was huddled with his cloak and he was keeping warm by the fire. And maybe, just in my opinion, maybe someone threw another log on the fire and the fire bursted up and there was a beam of light everywhere and someone caught his face. His face was sort of lit up by the fire and the flames. And someone recognized Peter. Someone recognized his face in, in the firelight. And straight away... One of the women there recognized him, and straight away he denies any connection without any thought or anything. It's the first thing that comes out. He denies any connection with Jesus. No hesitation at all. But here, I think, is the forgotten bit. Again, any prudent man would have thought, I better leave the courtyard now because someone's just recognized me. No, 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 not Peter. No, 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 not him. He's going, not going anywhere. He's going to stay because that's what he said he'd do. Even now that fear's kicking in and he's absolutely terrified and he's scared. And some woman's gone, right, do I know you? I know your face. The same thing happens again. He's recognized in a different way. And again, he denies Jesus. But again, he doesn't move. What is going on there with this bloke? He's still there. He's in the courtyard. He's been recognized once. He's been recognized twice. The boss is getting sort of a mock trial going on. He's in a really bad state. He's still there. He didn't budge. He didn't want to go or he couldn't go. Why not? Why not? You know, it says that um, Peter brought down curses. And, uh, and if you look at that and you look at some of the commentaries, he didn't curse Jesus' name. 
He cursed himself, basically, that's what he did. He cursed himself and swore about himself, and he brought down curses on himself for not telling the truth. He knew he was lying when he said that. He knew what he was doing, and he couldn't bear it. You know, he, he spent three years with the master, uh, and he loved him, really loved him. And now he was denying him, and, and he couldn't bear it. So he was cursing himself, in my opinion. But still, it seems Peter isn't going to move. Why? Think about it yourself. Why? Then something happens. Probably something like this. This is my terminology of it, really. Um, you know, my way of thinking what happened. The Roman night, as you know, was divided into four watches, four shifts, um, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And, and the end of the third shift was 3 a.m. And the guard was changed. And if you've done stags, that's a nightmare stag. You know, it's when someone... You're on? Oh, no, I can't bear it. You've just got yourself asleep. Anyway, it's the worst stag, I think, that, as, as a military person. And, and when the guard changed, they had this thing where a bugle was sounded, uh, which was called, if I get it right, it's called calalesium, which is Latin for cock crow. I didn't know that. So in my mind, as Peter issued his third denial of Jesus, he heard this bugle sound, which we know was changing the shifts for the guards and all that, that stuff. And he heard it in the courtyard, and it landed in Peter's ear. It just went off. And when it landed in Peter's ear, it made him think. And he remembered the words that Jesus, and it caused his heart to break. Peter, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He warned him. I find that extraordinary. And that must have gone off. And... You know, before the cock crows twice, he would have denied me three times. And he goes, not me, Lord, I'll stay with you forever. You know, that sort of stuff. And while Jesus' trial is going on upstairs, in that mock trial, that, that awful thing that went on with the high priest, another trial is going on down in the courtyard. The trial is Peter's faithfulness to Jesus is on trial. And it's a real personal one, I think. You know, a servant girl is the judge. I'm not making excuses for Peter, but he fell to a temptation. But in my opinion, he fell to a temptation which would only have come to a man of fantastic courage to, to stay there and, and go through that stuff. Again, why? I don't want to criticize Peter for falling to a temptation which would never in the same circumstances have come to me. Why? Because I'd have probably legged it at the garden. I probably would. I'd have thought, do you know what, I'm going to disappear. I've got some stuff in my hand. I'm going to disappear, come back and fight again. Do you know what I mean? But, uh, but uh, uh, or is it a, a live dog than a dead lion? You know, I'll, I'll hide and I'll come back and I'll sort it all out later. That would have been me. So I wouldn't have fallen to that temptation at the fire to deny him because I just wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have put myself there. Fight another day. And every person, every man, talking to men, every man has his breaking point. And Peter had reached his at this point. But I reckon 99.9% .9 of people, of men, would have reached their breaking point long before Peter did. I, I really do. I mean, I, mean I, I would. And consider this. If you're thinking now, well, I wouldn't do that. That's not what I would do. I'd stay there. Just remember that's what Peter said. <laughs> I ain't going anywhere, Lord. They can all leave you. I'm going to stay with you till, till I die. That's me. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Come on. Let's crack on. So if you're thinking that, be careful what you're thinking. And one of the saddest lines in Scripture comes at the end of that passage in Mark, uh, where, where it says in, in some commentaries, you know, it says, um, you know, that Peter went away and wept bitterly. And I told you about, you know, when, when Amanda was really poorly and we were in Istanbul and I, I got woken up in my sleep by crying and I wept bitterly. So I know a little bit what, what that feels like. And I think it's a really sad verse. And verse 54 in that, what I asked you to read, it says that Peter followed at a distance. Followed at a distance. He's still there. Let's give him credit for that. He'd already abandoned him in the garden, but now he comes back to follow the proceedings against Jesus. And let's just pause for a minute and consider whether we're following Jesus at a safe distance. It's not put your hands up. It's not to make you feel guilt or anything. But are you? Are we? Am I following Jesus at a safe distance? Or am I cracking in, getting close? Are we interested in him, but not willing to suffer for him? 
in different ways. We live in a very privileged country, but, you know, we can still suffer in certain ways. Do we practice social distancing, you know, from Jesus in public? You know, I work for a very secular organization. I'll share some stuff with you in a minute, but uh, Jesus isn't on the walls, I can assure you, in Iceland Foods, in the head office. You know, do we practice social distancing from Jesus in public? Not in here, not in church, in public. And a real practical way to know that, if we are doing that, is to ask yourself, you know, what are the people with whom we interact on a daily basis, do they know, do our colleagues know that we're Christians? You probably say, yeah. Do they know that you love Jesus and that you follow him? It's up to you to work that one out. I'm not asking if we talk about Jesus all the time, and walk around with a Bible under our arm and all that sort of stuff. I'm asking if people closest to us know we're in allegiance with Jesus. Again, ponder that. Do our words and actions and attitude reflect that we live for Jesus? Not in a cheesy way. I don't don't mean that in a weird way. I mean in a strong way about the way we are. Do do, do we not just go with the flow? Do we say, hang on a minute, I can't quite agree with that. Uh, No, I don't want to do that. Oh, come on. No, I don't want to do it. Are we doing that or are we not doing that? Well, let's not get weird about being a Christian. You know, just what are we doing? So Peter not only wanted to be safe, he always wanted to, I think he wanted to be comfortable as well with it. Um, And verse 54 says that he sat with the guards to warm himself at the fire. Now two things are going on there. I think he wanted to warm himself. He wanted to be near Jesus, but he's scared. But he sat with the people that arrested him and were going to betray him. What's he doing there with 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 those people? People... Peter is mingling with the people who likely arrested Jesus and were about to beat him up. You know, he was so concerned for his own safety and so fearful that he didn't realize he was rubbing shoulders with the guys who had arrested his friend, the master. He forgot where he was. Scared. Fear. It's a tool of the enemy, isn't it? All the time. Fear. Make us fearful. And then we'll do, he can get us to do anything he wants. So fearful that he didn't realize where he was. Peter was interested, I think, in what was happening to Jesus. Of course he was, he loved him, as long as it didn't interfere with his safety and comfort. And I think there's something to, to look at there for, for all of us. Um, you know, to, 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 to be in that state of fear. So do we live for safety and comfort, or are we out there following Jesus? Uh, I don't mean in sackcloth and ashes and all that sort of stuff. You know, I like nice things. I don't mean give everything to the poor and run away and live in a tent. I don't mean that uh, uh, as a Christian. I mean, what are we doing? What about you? Are safety and comfort controlling objectives in your life? Again, a couple of questions to help you think through that. And Have you ever invited any of your co-workers to, to church? Uh, have you ever had them over for dinner? Have you tried to share the gospel with them? You know, I was saying to someone at dinner, he does it at the... Just at the most awkward times, you know, when you're not ready for it, you, you, now would be a good time to share your faith. And you go, if you're me, not now, Lord, no, no not here. Yeah, yeah now would be good. Open your mouth. And what's he say in the scriptures? Open your mouth and God will give you the words. You just have to open your mouth. And if you don't believe that, try it. It really works. Just look there, stupid, and open your mouth. And words will come out. They really do, because it says it in the Bible, and I've tried it. It works, because God's not going to embarrass you about himself, is he? He's not going to do that. But it takes courage to do that stuff. Um, but try it, and I'm sure you've been caught in that stuff. When I went to, um, so someone asked me how I got, how I got the job, and I just I want to do it uh, quickly. Is What I'm doing now is, uh, you know, from church to director of uh, in Iceland Foods. So I... Um, I was doing some trips in, in Africa when I was with uh, HTB. Uh, we, used to do, uh, we used to do an African trip every year, a different part of Africa, and I did it for about 10, 11 years. And we'd have an alpha conference out there, and the team would go out, Nikki and everybody, and, I, and I'd go out uh, on staff as, um, as a prison person. And where they went into, I don't know, if we went into Lagos or we went somewhere else or Botswana or whatever, We'd have a conference and I'd find out the prison there and I'd take some people into the prison, mostly donors, wealthy people who came with us. I'd throw them in the nick and I'd show them what it's like. Then I'd say, can I have some money to to help these people in prison? That's what I did every year. 
And one of the times we were there, I went to, we went to Botswana, did the conference, which was fantastic. Uh, and, I, and I took some people to, to the prison, which was horrendous, uh, 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 some wealthy people. And uh, when we finished that, they came out and they were blown away by it because it, it was awful. It was, it was a terrible place. And then um, this couple that are quite wealthy from, from Malaysia said, um, we're going to stay on and have three days uh, and go to like a safari park. Do you want to come? <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, so, you know, I asked Nicky, he said, yeah, stay on for a few days and go. And me and a couple of the team uh, stayed on and we went to the, um, the Okavanga Delta in Botswana, if, if you know that stuff. I had no idea where we were going. And, uh, you know, it was a private jet out to there. And then we got this boat and then and this place was on stilts and it had white tablecloths and silver. Co it was really posh. And uh, I, I, um, the team I was with went upstairs to get changed for, for dinner uh, and they said they'd be down. I, I thought, I'll, I'll get a drink at the bar. And I went to the bar and I was in shorts and Timberland boots and, and a singlet, I'd finished work, I hadn't shaved a little bit. I was chilling. And, then, and I went to the bar and I said, look, could I have a couple of glasses of champagne? Could I have a gin and tonic? Could I have a whiskey? Could I have this? And, and I have a pint of lager for myself. And I ordered these drinks. And then this voice at the side of me said, uh, are you with that mob that's just come in? I said, um, yeah, I am. Well, what are you doing then? I said, um, you're a bit necky, aren't you? Yeah, this bloke was stood next to me. I said, um, I said, I'm, 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 I'm here on a, on, a, on a spa day sort of thing. We've got three days here. I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm just getting some drinks for my friend. So what do you do then? I said, well, I'll tell you what, guess what I do? And he went, well, you look like some safari rep. I said, <laughs> I said no, I'm not a safari rep. He says, uh, well, this place is expensive. Do you work in banking? I said, no, I don't work in finance. No. And he went through, are you a copper? I said, no, I'm not. No, no. He went through these things. And I said, um, I said, uh, no, it's painful. I said, I'm a priest. I'm a vicar in the Church of England. And, and I'd love to tell you what, he's a 76-year-old Yorkshire man. This was Malcolm Walker. And uh, I won't tell you exactly what he said, but there was a few colourful words in it. And he said, you, a vicar? Well, what? I said, yeah, I'm a vicar. And, and he said, so, so what did you do? So I told him a testimony. I was looking at him. He's quite, quite hardcore. And uh, I just opened my mouth. And then the testimony came out. I said, well, I was born in Salford, my father. You know, I went through the whole thing. And then I told him what I was doing, what we were here, the prisons and everything. And he said, uh, do you know who I am? I said, I've no idea who you are. He said, my name is Malcolm Walker. Uh, and he said, I'm the founder of Iceland Foods. Do you know that? I said, yeah, 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 I know Iceland Foods. Everyone does. He said, uh, well, I'm really interested in this ex-offender stuff. And maybe we can get some, some of the people you work with in, in, in the stores. I said, good idea. He said, well, I'm going in the morning. I'll, I'll leave you my card. I said, yeah, they all say that. But in the morning, there was an envelope, and it had um, the vicar on the front of it. Open. <laughs> I, op I opened it, and, and it was his business card. And, and it said, call me when you get back to London. So I called him. Again, long story short, and he says, uh, can you get to Battersea? I said, yeah, there's a heliport there, heliport in Battersea. His helicopter was waiting for me. <laughs> so... Uh, they said, is it Reverend Paul Cow? They said, yeah, it is. He said, uh, Sir Malcolm's helicopter is going to take you to Chester, the head office. So I went to Chester, um, <laughs> went, landed, <laughs> as you do. I went in there and uh, he, he met me. Big, big office, 700 staff there in the head office, 30,000 staff around the stores. And I, I go in there and um, this was 13 years ago now. And uh, he opens these doors and, uh, and I look and there's this big board table and there's all the investors there's about 15 of them all suited and booted around this sort of table, all looking really glum, you know. And, uh, and he pushes me in and he goes, um, this is Paul. I met him in Botswana. He's going to tell you his story and what he does. And he shut the door and left me there. <laughs> I said, hi, <laughs> my name's Paul. Uh, and, and I met Malcolm and, uh, and, uh, and I told him the story and testimony again and, and what I do. And uh, I said, thank you very much. Uh, and I walked out. He said, how did it go? I said, terrible. There wasn't one sort of smile or, or nothing. I couldn't get anything through any of them. Not interested. They, they just thought, shareholders, they thought, who is this bloke that Malcolm's met that wants us to get involved in prison work and put ex-offenders in us? I don't think so. So I said, it's terrible. So I went with him down, down to his office. He said, well, let's have a crack at it anyway. I said, all right. So, again, long story short, I tried to put two ex-offenders 
uh, into Iceland and it, and it failed miserably. I mean, HR hated me. The store managers weren't interested. The area managers couldn't give a monkeys and it was a nightmare. Uh, and the two guys went in and, the, and one of them got sacked straight away and the other guy just didn't take him. And, and I said to Malcolm, it, it, it's not working. Uh, nice try, but it ain't working. And we parted company. Uh, and I didn't see him really then, on and off at events in London, but I didn't see him for another 12, 13 years. And the reason I told you about that scripture, you know, that God has a good and perfect plan, at the same time that was going, I'd forgotten about him, at the same time that was going on, I was getting a bit sort of, a bit fed up at HTB. I'd done a lot of stuff there, been there for 20 odd years, started three sites, done two charities, you know, all that stuff. And everything was being married, man, managed by young things. It was going great. The prison work, the forces, everything was fantastic. Uh, and I remember standing at the back of church going, I think my work's done here. Uh, you know, I, I'm not that old, but, you know, Lord, if you've got another job, it'd be quite nice. I think there's a job somewhere, but I have no idea what it is. And, and you say those prayers, and I forgot about it. And I cracked on. I'm, uh, we've moved. We've moved up to the, to the Midlands now. Um, I'm, you know, we're up there to look after my mother-in-law. We're doing all that. It's fine. We're cracking on. Uh, you know, things are going okay. And then, um, then I'm out for lunch with my mother-in-law and, and Amanda, and my mobile rings. And uh, it's just a number. And I go, hello, Paul Cowley, who is it? Uh, it's Malcolm, Paul. Uh, Malcolm who? Malcolm. <laughs> Malcolm Bloody Walker, he says. <laughs> I said, oh, Malcolm, hi, how are you? He said, good, what are you doing? I said, I'm just having lunch with my mother-in-law. And he said, uh, right, um, where do you live now? I said, I live in the Midlands. Is there any fields around there? <laughs> <laughs> I said, Malcolm, it's the Midlands. There's fields everywhere and sheep and cows. And he goes, right, can you find me somewhere to land me helicopter? That's what he says to me. So I, spoke, I found an airfield near me, uh, just a big paddock. And, uh, and I gave his PA the coordinates. And uh, he comes with his helicopter and we go for lunch. And uh, I think, what the heck is going on here? We'll go for a second to a pub that I know. We have a lunch. We have a few beers. He says, um, I can't do his accent, but he's real North Yorkshire. He goes, uh, this, this sort of, a uh, few F words in it, but this, in every sentence, this uh, ex-offender stuff. I said, yeah. He said, well, I, I've been thinking about it. I said, that was like 13 years ago. He said, I know, but I can't get it out of my head. So can you come up to Chester? I said, I'm not doing that board thing again with all those people and you shutting the door on me. I ain't doing that. He said, no, there is no board anymore. There's no shareholders. If you look at the story of Iceland, they, they, they sacked him. They, the owner and the founder, the shareholders, sacked him and threw him out. And, and he left. And they brought someone else in who made a complete mess of it. You can read about it. And it went to the brink of uh, bankruptcy. And when it got at its lowest ebb, he bought it back. <laughs> when this guy had knackered it completely, he bought it back. Borrowed some money from different people and bought it. And now it's a successful £5 billion pound Turnover, 30,000 staff, you know, 1,200 stores, 5,000, it's going really well. And it's owned by him and his son, Malcolm and Richard. It's one of the biggest companies that's owned by a family still. We, we don't do that. So uh, I said, oh, it's different. So uh, he said, um, so what do I need to do then if we do this stuff? And, and I went up to see him and I just said, what you need to do is you need to, you know, hire someone at a director level, senior level. You need to throw some money at it, need some resources. You need to do this, you need to do that. He said, great. When can you start? <laughs> I said, no, 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 not me. I've got a job. I'm at HTV. I'm working. You know, I'm, 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 I'm all right. I'm, uh, then I remembered that prayer. Oh, Lord, if you've got another job for me, that would be really good. <laughs> And in his desk, this is the bit, in, in his office, he, he said, no, I, I want you to come and start it. Uh, I, I want it to be a sort of a legacy. I, I want to, you know, in 10 years, I, I want 10% of my staff to be men and women from prison. And I thought, 30, 000, that's 3,000 people. That starts to make a big difference to reoffending in the UK, if you can employ that many people. And I got really excited. And, uh, and, I, and I heard myself say, yeah, why not? And then, and then I could... <laughs> completely panicked so so he knocks on he, he picks his phone up he rings he goes can you come up here uh so the next minute there's a knock on the door hello sir malcolm it's one of his directors it's the director of hr um helen tyndall who's quite a fierce character and she stands there she goes yes sir malcolm and he goes right this is paul he's now a, a director of rehabilitation he needs this salary, he needs a car, he needs an office space, he needs to sort the stuff out, and he'll be down in about 20 minutes to sign his contract, right? And she goes, yes, sir, Malcolm. 
and then totters off. <laughs> and, I, and I said to Malcolm, oh my God, that's the first enemy I've got straight away. You can't, you can't do that to the head of HR. He goes, oh, she'll be fine. Anyway, so I went down to her and said, Helen, I'm sorry about that. She goes, no, I've worked for him for 30 years. I know what he's like. So what do you want? He told me you want this, that, and that. And that was me. That was my job. And I thought, I best tell someone I've left the church. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying, God has this plan. That's how I got that. Because someone asked me to share how, how, how I got it. And then, and then being in this secular environment, which it is, very secular environment, from where I was at HTB, it's very different. And, uh, and, and it's been really interesting. I took the reverend off my business card. They don't do business cards, but I wanted one because I work in prisons. Because there's, there's no, you can't take gadgets in there. So I just had Paul Cowley on it, on it. And then I felt really bad about that in my heart. I thought, oh, there's a bit of scripture about dishonoring, dishonoring Jesus. I'm in big trouble here. I've took the reverend off. I'm, I'm, I'm a coward. So I really thought. And I thought, anyway, I've got to do it. I'll just do Paul Cowley. And I got these business cards. And, and it's been an extraordinary an extraordinary journey. So Helen, from I don't think she liked me very much, we've become good mates because I thought I've got to get her in a prison. So I took her into a female prison and interviewed some women in there and it broke her heart. She, she couldn't bear it and she got it. And she's been great. And I've got five of her team now that work for me uh, doing, doing this rehabilitation work. And then she said to me the other day, um, Paul, can we have a coffee at some point? I said, yeah, we just, I was near her office. I said, yeah, well, what about Helen? She went, well, I've read your book. Didn't know she had the book. She said, I've read your book. And, and there's a bit in there that you, you're in church and you're talking about this church you're in. What's it called? I said, Holy Trinity. Yeah, you're in that church in London. And then you talk about this thing that falls on people. And they're all lying on the floor. And she said, what is going on there? I said, well, that's the Holy Trinity. Not now, she said. I don't want to talk about it now. But I want to know what went on and what's going on with that stuff. What's going on there? Is that a witness or what? Well, uh, I didn't say anything. She's describing the Holy Spirit and the falling and the Spirit coming on people. She hasn't got the words to describe it, but something's happening and she wants it. And then the next thing that happened, and then we'll, we'll finish off. The next thing that happened then is, um, so I'm on the executive wing, this little corridor. How I got in there, I don't know. Well, I asked for it and I got it. And then, <laughs> I, was, I was asking for someone else, not for me, but I got what I asked for. And I thought, oh, well, I'm a director and, and, and I'm on the exec. That's nice. And, and I'm in there, and um, Jade, his PA, private secretary, Malcolm, says, um, Paul, the books are in the post room. I go, okay, I'm bluffing it. Squaddy, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the books. No idea what she's talking about. She says, um, and there's a compliment slip in all of them, and, and Sir Malcolm wants you to go and sign them. I said, um, which, 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 which books are they again? She said, they're your book. I said, oh, right, yes, I'll go down. There's 250 books, those, that Sir Malcolm had ordered to give to all his senior staff. So all his directors, his area managers, his regional managers, the, all the head of hate, all that stuff, I've got that book with a compliment slip in it, signed by him. And I think, what is going on there? And I said to him, you've given my book out to everyone. He goes, yes. I said, um, it, it's... It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know what to say. It's like a Christian book. It's full on. If you've read it, it doesn't mess around. Especially, he said, yeah, I like the beginning of it. Not too keen on the middle bit and the end bit, but that's the church. He said, but I thought, I thought they should, uh, I thought they should have it. And I thought, the bloke's evangelizing for me. He's gave, you know, and now I have all these conversations because the directors and everyone have, have read the book. And I thought, that's extraordinary in a secular environment. I'm not doing anything. I'm just being me, and God is doing it, and all I have to do is follow up. So I had the conversation with Helen. We had a, a drinks party the other night, all the directors and all his area managers in Chester, and it was a bit of a, bit of a booze up. And at the end when I'm walking, because it's getting a bit lively, and I thought I'll go to the hotel where I am, I, I get a tap on the shoulder, and it's one of the directors. It's, it's Richard, who's the uh, chief finance officer. I've only spoken about four words to him. He says, oh, Paul, I, I'd love to have a word at, at some time. I said, yeah, Richard, whenever you want. He says, um, because, because I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> really quietly, because I'm a Christian and I go to church. And uh, they, they know about you in the church with this course called Alpha. And, uh, and, and I, and I, and I, and I want to know more about my faith and I'm not sure about it. And I wonder if we could talk and maybe we could pray. 
I thought, oh my goodness, it's the chief finance officer. So, you know, so God works in these mysterious places. So I think we should be amazed at Peter's courage rather than, than shocked at it. Uh, and another point which uh, I think makes this whole story actually quite remarkable to finish it is that there, there's only one source that this story could have come from. Peter. It had to come from him. He had to admit all those failures and that stuff that's going to be written down for time immemorial. It had to be him that did it. You know, meaning that Peter must have told this story of denying the master over and over again, saying, you know, this is what I did. Three times I ran away, I denied him, and I was a nightmare, and it was awful. And, uh, and I bet his next sentence was, you know, but I did all that, but Jesus never stopped loving me, never stopped loving me uh, at all. And like I said, you know, uh, every man has his breaking point, and, and Peter had, uh, had reached his. Um, and it's a remarkable story. I've just lost my page a minute. Give me a second. Uh, it's a remarkable story. And, and I, wanted to, um, I wanted to finish by telling you a story, then, then I wanted to pray. Because I think we can all get caught up um, in, in this fear thing. And so for me, Peter was a very brave man in doing what he did. There's this story, and you may have heard it about a preacher many years ago called Brownlow. Have you heard of him? Uh, he, he, was a, he was a northerner. He was a real character. He was a man of God. But in his youth, he'd been quite a, a wild character, a drinker, a womanizer, a, a bit naughty. Uh, and one Sunday, he was about to preach to this large sort of gathering, this tent, um, you know, this mission thing in, in Aberdeen. And just before he entered the pulpit as he was going up, someone handed him a note. And, uh, and uh, the writer of the letter had recounted a very shameful incident that the preacher uh, was involved in in his past life and stated that if he preached, that the letter would be distributed and all the contents would be shown to everybody and it would make it public. And Brownlow took the letter, I love it, he took the letter to the pulpit with him and he read the letter out loud and said exactly what he'd done and that Jesus had forgiven him. Then he told them that through Christ, he had been forgiven and redeemed. And that had helped him change and become the person he is now. And on that night, it goes on to say in the, in the commentary that I read, that never had so many people come to Christ in that tent. So what the enemy does to try and shame us and make, them fear, make us fearful, if we're brave and courageous, Peter, if we're brave and courageous, it changes. And people came to Christ. You know, I work for a secular organization. I don't work in the church anymore. But I've got my boss evangelizing into 240 of his staff. What's going on there? And that book's going everywhere. So in my opinion, what Peter did, you know, he told people, you know, I hurt him, I let him down, and yet he still loved me and forgave me. And you know the bit that I always think, remember, you know, Peter sees Jesus on the beach, doesn't he, later on, uh, and Jesus is cooking breakfast, he's doing a fry up or something. And, um, and Peter's so excited, the scripture, he jumps out of the boat and he runs to, to meet Jesus on the beach and uh, you know, glass half full, he's really excited. And then I think he remembers what he did. Glass half empty, straight away, fear comes in. And, uh, you know, it goes on to say that, oh, I think he kind of dropped to his knees and he says, get away from me, Lord. Get away from this wretched man. And Jesus says, hey, come on, let's have some breakfast together. I knew what was going to happen and I knew where you're going to be. He loves us unconditionally. And that's the stuff, what the enemy wants to bring and, and destroy us. God can change it if we're brave and courageous enough to face it. And um, what I'd love to do now with, with Rhett is, is pray into that, into that stuff. We've got one more talk tomorrow. We've got um, communion.